Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today, uh, today's webinar. My name is Viviana Valencia and I'm the Executive Coordinator at Caldo Consortium. Uh, for this, this session, uh, we actually were starting a new series and this series is called Academic Webinars. Uh, during this series, we invited professors from our member universities to present on a specific topic and today's webinar is on biology. So all of you who are interested or who are currently doing uh, research in the area of biology, uh, welcome today and I hope um, you get to, to do the connections that, that, you, that you intend to. Before I start, um, I would like to briefly uh, introduce you to what's called, though, for those of you who are not familiar with the consortium. Um, and also, I would like just to, to provide you a bit of um, uh, information about housekeeping items. In case that you would like to ask a, a question to, to our main presenters, I will ask if you can um, make those, uh, those questions in the section that is uh, um, labeled Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You're going to find two boxes, one for the general chat and one for the Q&A. If you can know the questions in the Q&A, that'll be great. Um, Okay, so here's the agenda for, for the session. Uh, we're going to, to, to start by, again, pro pro providing you a bit of information about what, what the consortium is. After that, uh, we are going to um, introduce you to Laval Université, uh, the University of Saskatchewan, and then we'll, there will be a space for, for Q&A for, for, for you to ask your questions. Okay, so the consortium. Call the consortium. We a, are, um, as in the name says, a consortium of 10 universities now. And those two universities are the ones that you're seeing on your screen. Those are the University of Alberta, University of Calgary, Dalhousie University, Université Laval, McMaster University, the University of Ottawa, University of Saskatchewan, University of Toronto, University of Waterloo, and Western University. So those are the 10 universities that are part of the consortium. And those uh, presenters from different or various of these universities are going to be presenting throughout this, this, this series academic webinars. So what do we do at Caldo? Caldo is, um, you see it as a central focal point to connect with our member universities. And our main, our main objective is to assist prospective graduate students from Latin America to and the steps to apply to a graduate program um, at one of our member universities. So basically we offer free services to assist them with their application information in terms of application requirements, um, also how to connect with supervisors. We provide a range of, of, of free support for, for, for students. And you can find a lot of information on our website of some of our past webinars. You can find in them, for example, again, how to connect with a supervisor um, in terms of other programming, for example, uh, language courses that if you're interested on on uh, improving your 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 language skills either in French or in English you may find more information there um, sorry about that uh, yeah so um, here's our website and again I, I invite you to to come and to explore our website and if after you have some questions you can send us an email so you can uh, we can uh, further assist you Okay, so for today's webinar, um, we have invited two esteemed professors from uh, both uh, from two of our universities, and it's my pleasure to introduce you uh, first to Dr. Edel Perez Lopez. Um, Dr. Edel uh, has holds a bachelor in the deg uh, bachelor's degree in biochemistry from the Universidad de La Habana in Cuba. He also has a doctorate degree from Universidad Veracruzana in Mexico. He did two postdocs, uh, one at the University of Evern University in the United States, and the second at the University of Saskatchewan in Canada. In April 2020, Dr. Lopez joined Université Laval as an assistant professor and set up his own uh, phytopal phytopathology laboratory at the lab at uh, this university. Uh, at Edel Lab, uh, Dr. Lopez, along with his research team, studied the development of the end diagnostics methods to, uh, for the identification of phytopathogens <laughs> in the field and the study of the molecular me mechanisms used by phytopathogens to escape plant immunity. I'm sorry about that. You can tell that my background is not in science. Uh, well, welcome, Adele. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I will turn it over to you. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so you can share yours. Thank you.
So thank you very much for the invitation. And the name of the uh, short seminar is going to be uh, is understanding how plant pathogens evade plant immunity. I had a little presentation, but I think Viviana covered it uh, really good. Uh, I have a bachelor in, in biochemistry in Havana. Then I started to work as a researcher for around three years in Cuba. When I had the, well, I applied to a PhD in Universidad Veracruzana, uh, and I went with a, with a Conacyt scholarship. So I'm sure that many of you uh, uh, in the seminar are from Mexico and, and know about this kind of a scholarship. This scholarship also gave me the opportunity to came to Canada for first time because we have a portion of the scholarship that is to do internship during a graduate school. So later when I finished the PhD, I was able to go to United States and then came back to Canada to the University of Saskatchewan for a postdoc. Later during the second year of the second postdoc, I was offered this a uh, position here at Université Laval. And I want to tell you a little bit about the university. This university is the first French speaking university in so it's important to take that into consideration if you want to do a graduate school here in, in Université Laval. But don't worry because Quebec has so many opportunities to learn French. So if that is also in your goals, it's the perfect place. So we are a big university. We have at least 43,000 undergraduate students. We have more than 500 programs and we have more than $400 million for research. Université Laval, and this is a little bit confusing, is not located at Laval because Quebec has a city that the name is Laval, but this is located, our university is located in Quebec City, La Ville de Quebec. This place is amazingly gorgeous. You can see the picture, but is also the capital of the province. As I mentioned before, this province is a French speaking province. So you have to consider that if you want to study here, we have half million uh, habitants, which is not too much. You know, in Latin America, a small city can have more than a million. So this is big for Canada, believe me. Uh, this place is so beautiful that in 1985, it was considered World Heritage Place for the, by the UNESCO. So it's really, really beautiful. Our lab is located in the Center for Research and Innovation for Plant Science. This center has a professor from different departments. I am particularly in the a plant science department in the Faculty a, of Agriculture and food science. Our lab is here located and the main goal of our lab in the long term is to have plant resistant to biotrophic plant pathogens. Biotrophic plant pathogens are those that they need the plant alive to be able to proliferate and to be able to uh, do all the functions. So these pathogens develop different mechanisms than a necrotrophic, which, has, which are the pathogens that kill the plant uh, during the infection. So my main goal in the lab is to have plant resistance to this group of pathogens, but how we are going to have this resistance? Well, understanding how the pathogen can infect the plant, but also escape the plant immunity. Ideally in the future, I'm talking about 10, 15, 20 years from now, we will develop plants that are able to grow in the field with or without the pathogen. For that, we are focusing in one particular disease and the name is club rot. When I heard this, the name of this disease the first time, uh, in my brain, I was expecting like, oh, a club in the root. But sadly, the reality is a little bit uh, sad. So the presence of Plasmodifora brassica in the roots cause uh, galls or 
we don't like to call it tumors because they are not tumors, is like growings in the roots and uh, this caused the disease. This disease, clock root, hernia de crucifer or hernia de las cruciferas in Spanish, is a devastating disease affecting brassicas worldwide. And brassicas is a big group of crops. We have canola, we have broccoli, we have cabbage that are really important for the economy of many countries. So this disease is also in all Canada, mainly in uh, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Alberta. But here in Quebec, for example, we also grow canola and also grow a lot of veggies that they are brassicas. This disease is caused by uh, the soil burn. It's a pathogen that lives in the soil, unculturable, meaning that it can only uh, uh, proliferate in a living plant and because it's not, uh, we cannot isolate it in a plate. It's also intracellular and is biotrophic, also a protist. So this protein is really, really uh, different. It was also discovered in the 1700s, but still today in 2020 is a big mystery. So here is how it really looks, the uh, infected plants, the roots of the infected plants. Uh, and it can infect canola, broccoli, and cabbage. And as you can see, a plant with these symptoms die really quick because they cannot absorb water or nutrients. How it looks, because I've been talking about the pathogen, but haven't shown it. So here is how it looks in an infected root. This is uh, the spores right away after they penetrate in the cell. And this is the plasmodium which is the secondary infection, uh, the spore become a plasmodium and then this plasmodium produce more spores. So something that is known for many plant pathogens is that they use a, a, a kind of proteins known as effectors to be able to infect the plants and to be able to manipulate the plant because normally, I'm sure you, you know that the plants have a immune system, like a, the animals have immune systems, so the plants also have it. So the pathogen use these proteins to manipulate the, uh, the immune system. So here we have that fungi, omicet, bacteria, and nematodes is well known that they produce these effectors. But what about the protist? Because Plasmodifora brassica, is a protist. Well, during my previous work at the University of Saskatchewan, we found that indeed, this pathogen also produced effectors. And uh, we were able to characterize the second effector that has been characterized for this pathogen. The first one was this in yellow. And we were able to put these effectors in the plant defense uh, scenario. So based on all this work, I was curious because as I mentioned, we know that the plants have immune system and that the effectors are used to manipulate that immune system. But how Plasmodiophora brassica does that, we still don't know. So the first step that we are taking in the lab eh, are related with chitin. Chitin is a, com a component of the cell wall of the spore. So the plants have chitin receptors. So usually when a pathogen penetrates, the cell wall is breaking and it's releasing re a chitin and the plant can detect it and then fight the infection. But why the plant cannot detect Plasmodiophora brassica? Well, we look in the genome and it looks like Plasmodiophora have few genes that they codify a proteins that they bind chitin. So they bind the chitin or they transform the chitin or they degrade, degrade the chitin. So in this way, the plant cannot detect the chitin. So this was really interesting when we found this in the genome, but was more interesting 
uh, when we found that those genes are upregulated, uh, meaning that they are expressing during all the stage where you have a, a spore. Uh, so if you have a, a spore here germinating, most of the genes are upregulated. If you have a spore that is a mature also, but also if you have formation of a spore, which is the secondary infection. So this was really interesting. Of those, we selected three that they are only binding chitin. We express those genes in a bacteria, those proteins in a bacteria. We have them purified and now we are keep doing different analysis. I'm not going to uh, go deep too much on this, but it's something that we want to study. Although the main subject of the lab is going to be effector trigger immunity. This one here is pattern trigger immunity, but it's also interesting and could be complementing to effector trigger immunity to identify new sources of resistance. In our lab is really young, like uh, as uh, Viviana mentioned, we just start in April or May and during a pandemic. So you know that things have been really slow, but we always have opportunities uh, for students, for undergraduate, for graduate. And it would be amazing if uh, this year you can access to uh, some of the options that you have in your country, like Conacyt, like Concitec, uh, many different options that you have in Latin America. Uh, so I invite you to be in contact with Caldo, uh, even when also there is another opportunities like local funding uh, from the province and other institutions. But Caldo offer a perfect connection for you. So here in the lab, you can learn a PCR, a electrophoresis, working with plants, sequencing, a microscopy, but you have to bring something too, and it's curiosity, independence, critical and creative thinking, a, and commitment, because a, this is a, a project that they have a lot, a lot to do. So you can always be in contact with me uh, in, here is the edelab.ca. You can go to the webpage, uh, you can go to Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, or um, Instagram. So those are places that I post a lot of things related with work, most of them. And you can also send me an email if you are interested. But again, I invite you to go through Caldo. And if you, have question, please email message, email. <laughs> so that's everything. Thank you very much. Uh, gracias. Thank you very much, Adele. Uh, we're gonna get back to you in a minute uh, once uh, uh, Dr. Carlos has an opportunity to, to present. Perfect. And yes, I would like to remind our audience, if you would like to connect with either um, the, uh, Dr. Adele or Dr. Carlos, um, I will send, uh, at the end of the session, I will show you uh, a brief form that you can find on our website where you can fill out the form and just mention that you would like to connect with one of the, the presenters and we can we can make the arrangement for the connections. Thank you so much, Adele. Um, yeah, so now it's my pleasure to introduce to Dr. Carvalho. Dr. Carvalho is an associate professor at the Department of Biology at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, he has a background in mo molecular genetics. He, is, he holds a bachelor's degree in, in molecular biology from the University of Campinas from Unicamp Brazil, a master of science in molecular embryology from the University of Osaka, Japan, and a PhD in molecular genetics from the University of Alberta in Canada. As a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Medical School and at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, Dr. Cavallo worked with C. Eleganzo to better understand the proper segregation of chromosomes during the meiosis and the hypoxia tolerance during ischemic events. He took a position with the University of Saskatchewan in 2010, and since then, Dr. Cavallo's lab has been working to understand how the production influences aging and more recently, the novel role of canonical cell cycle regulators in cilia. 
His lab uses C. elegansis, a model system, and applies a suite of techniques from classical and molecular genetics to gen edited and high definition microscopically to dissect gene function. Thank you very much, Carlos, for being with us today. Uh, leave the floor to you. Can you see it? No, not yet. No. No. Sorry, did you share um, my little loss here? What I need to do? Mm, no and worries. Uh, Juan Jose, do you have a uh, Dr. Carvalho uh, presentation open? If so, can you share your screen? I would rather share mine, but I forgot how to actually. Ah, you just have to open it on your desktop. Right. Uh, press share screen. And yeah, I, I did that, but it, it doesn't seem to, so I, I did that again. Can you see it now? Uh, not yet. If, if not, I think um, Juan Jose can, can, can provide support with, on that, with that. So did you, did you share, oh, hold on a second. I've got it. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, Dr. Caballo is a, setting up the presentation. I'd just like to provide a brief information about something that, um, I'm just gonna call you Adele, that Adele mentioned. So Caldo, aside, yes, yes, we are seeing it right now. I'll give you the information after the presentation okay. from Dr. Carvalho. Sorry, yeah, sorry about that. No worries, no worries. But, you know, different generation, <laughs> trouble with technology sometimes. I'm here with you on that one. <laughs> All right, so uh, thank you for Caldo, thank you Viviana and Maria and for the opportunity to talk a little bit and showcase the research in my lab. And, and nice to see Adele. Funny enough, Adele used to have a, a desk in front of my office not long ago at the Department of Biology here when he was a postdoc. And now it's good to see he's got his own lab. So all the luck for you, Adele, and in Laval. So uh, I'm just going to take a few minutes to explain a little bit about uh, uh, to just to it here. So, um, as uh, Viviana said, I'm Dr. Carlos Cavallo. I'm Brazilian. But Brazilian. I, I've been away for a while. I did my graduate school in Japan and then Canada, and I moved to the States for a postdoc, and then I returned to Canada, and eventually got a job. So it took a long time, but eventually I got settled here in Saskatchewan, which is home of the, for the University of Saskatchewan. You see the campus in this picture here. The University of Saskatchewan is located in Saskatoon. Saskatoon is a city of about 300,000 people which as Adele mentioned for Canadian standards is not really that small, but it's got everything that you would need in a big city. It's uh, located right in the heart of the Canadian prairies. So it has this typical continental climate. So very pleasant summers, very dry and pleasant than you see here and very long and cold winters as well that we prefer not to talk too much about it because it doesn't really entice people to come, but it's also a pretty beautiful uh, scenery in the winter. Um, my lab is located in the Department of Biology. We just recently moved to a new building that Adele knows well, the Collaborative Science Research Building, or um, CSRB, which uh, uh, has host our labs here in the second floor. That's our window in the Department of Biology. And uh, my lab, so the Carvalho lab, has uh, inter basically three interests which intersect often in terms of projects, but the outline here, um, with respect to understanding the genetic components of aging, the genetic components of meiosis in the germline, and also the genes are important for defining or the sense to perception, the ability of organisms and cells to sense their environment. This might seem like very different topics, but it turns out several different genetic pathways intersect here in terms of function. Um, we're not gonna have time to talk about germline or aging, which are work that we do in different projects. So I'm gonna concentrate and tell a little bit about sensor perception so you have an idea what we do. And that goes back to the idea of how is it that animals and cells can sense the environment. So we all know that we have the ability to detect cues in the environment and that's obviously important. And the, the one thing to imagine that is an animal that has to go away from a predator or goes towards some sort of food or other mates that it potentially needs to mate with. So that ability of uh, sense the environment and it's critical to, to define the aspects of evolutionary 
a success of an organism or a species, the ability to forage or to go away from, from uh, bad cues or, or other animals or plants, they're not necessarily pleasant to them, right? So animals must track towards food and away from hazards and leaves us with the basically question on the genetic level, how is it that cells and organisms can define or control the structures and functions they're able to then to transmit that information as far as chemical signals and also electric signals to the organism. Sorry, I'm out of the thing here, there we go. All right, so when we think about sensory perception, potentially what, you, what comes to mind first is that uh, uh, the presence of those important sensory organs that higher vertebrates have, so you and me and other animals. So you think about me mechanoreceptors in the auditory system or the other receptors in your nose or mechanoreceptors in the sense of tactile, tactile receptors and obviously your vision, your photoreceptors. So it turns out all of these are important and specialized cells types of neurons that share one particularity and that's the ability to produce cilia in their membranes, so the ciliated cells. So what is cilia? So cilia turns out is present pretty much everywhere in the eukaryotic tree, all the way from the unicellular organisms here that you know, live by themselves and have to, to find a living there in their environments without having to worry about other cells to share their, their um, body with, all the way to vertebrates and higher eukaryotic cells, they have then cilia too. And this could be either by com to communicate to other cells, as say in, uh, in cells in human cells, for instance, but also in the evolution of very specialized systems, the sensory organs, which are then important in defining that ability to perceive specific types of uh, sensory inputs that I showed you. So your vision, your uh, tactile senses, your, your smell sense, right? But they're found everywhere. So they're very um, common structures and they depend on the structuring of this specific uh, cellular organelle called the cilium. And the cilium here is essentially a, um, a, a structure that it's made off of a shaft made of, of microtubules, so tubulin that it's polymerized here in an axoneme structure that you've probably seen before, that it's anchored in the basal body to the cell here. So it stays stay put in the membrane by anchoring through this part of the cell. And through which then several proteins have to be transported up and down through a system of cargo that depends on motor protein shown here that bring up all the specific receptors that the cilia is going to display outside to the environment to perceive those, those cues and also remove all the things that need to be turned over and get out of cilia, so in the other direction. So this process then uses the microtubules here as tracks in order for pulling up stuff and taking stuff down from the cilia and they are critical for the actually health of the cilia and the function. So that's how the specific receptors to different, uh, to different chemical cues, for instance, are displayed in the top of the membrane. The other specific component or domain of cilia that it's actually very important resides right here, slightly above from the basal body, and that's the ciliary gate that's composed of other types of proteins which are sorting what comes up and what comes out very specifically. So they define or they regulate what can go in and can go out. As you can see, there's several different aspects of the cilia inside this small organelle that carry different functions in terms of protein uh, composition, and that's important because it turns out defects in different of these proteins can lead to different defects in sensory perception. Now, cilia and flagellin, you might have uh, um, probably been exposed to this before, is not a new organelle. People, people and researchers have known of it for, for hundreds of years at this point, at least 150 years. Um, but for the last 40 years or so, it kind of fell off fashion. So cell biologists and researchers really didn't think cilia was of much importance. It was, more, it was taking more as this sort of remnants, this leftover structure that wasn't really important in how you eukaryotes. But all of this changed in the last 15 years when researchers through the genomic analysis of uh, and the, the sort of hunting of human genetic disorders uh, end up finding that several genes, several disorders, or at least 35 different disorders map to genes which make up components of the cilia. And these are grouped together in a very diverse group of genetic disorders called the ciliopathies, which are growing by the ear, it seems like. And they define then um, a different set of proteins that might be important for function of cilia and therefore bringing cilia again to the forefront in terms of interest in clinical research. So nowadays, our researchers respect cilia much more than they used to because of the realization that several of those human disorders are because of defects in cilia. And you can see they affect all kinds of different aspects of our function here, but noticeable are 
uh, tissues and organs do have sensory functions. So you see, for instance, blindness and deafness, for instance, which are obviously are due to because of defects in those sensory neurons that I showed in the beginning. But it affects overall several different organs because it turns out pretty much every cell in the human body is ciliated, right? Sorry. All right, so our lab is interested in understanding a little bit about how cilia is structured and how it functions using a model organisms. And we are a genetics lab, so we sort of try to hunt down for genes that are important for this process. And for this, we can use humans. Obviously, we're not really subjects for research at that level. So we have to choose a model organism. My lab works with, as Bibiana mentioned, a tiny small nematode called C. elegans, which is uh, very useful for different types of genetic research. And uh, specifically, as far as cilia is concerned, for all the particularities here that I pointed in a minute, but it's a small organism, it's about one millimeter in length, so very small. It's very genetically tractable, has a very large research community and a lot of resources as far as research is concerned. It was the first eukaryotic organisms to have the genome sequenced and it's by far the best annotated genome by far uh, today. And it has the entire cell lineage is known. It's the only organism that we know exactly what is the orange of every single cell in the adult as far as its embryonic, embryonic orange. For the specific uh, work in cilia, it's a, a very useful organism because we can actually see the sensory neur neuron shown in red here, which can be staining the animal as it's alive. So you can see the animal moving and track down the specific cells, which are sensory neurons that shoot dendrites to the tip of the nose, which you see in the end here. And it's specifically in the tip of the nose there that you have cilia forming. And here shown then the same tip of the nose region and tip of the tail region here, which have those sensory neurons in green that shoot up cilia in the top until it opens to the environment where those chemical cues can be perceived. So cilia is present in those two structures of the C. elegans uh, adults, and they perform functions that are very similar to what you would find in the cilia in, uh, in human cells, for instance. They are sensory neurons, which have an important um, a role in terms of detecting information from outside of the environment and guiding then the specific behavior of the worm. Worms don't have eyes or ears or taste. That's their eye, ear, and taste, right? It's those structures. So, so you see how important it is. You can imagine, for instance, a substrate here in which worms are tracking and that our specific research kind of coated certain areas with an attractant. So something that the worms like, and they like because they can perceive that through their ciliated neurons and track towards. So you see how the roaming of these animals are not at random. They actually go around and eventually they stay on the regions where you find this attractant. So this chemotaxis ability of C. elegans depends essentially on those ciliated cells and therefore provides you with a readout phenotype that you can use to look for the genes which are important for this behavior behavior, and these genes should be somehow related to cilia function. So this is the pipeline of research you do in the, in the lab. So when we're interested to find the different genes which are involved in cilia perception, we want to find mutations now that can potentially reveal those defects. We use different types of, uh, of uh, assays, behavior assays, that measure the ability of the worm of the C. elegans to respond to a known chemical signal. So again, we have two types of signals, things that animals goes towards, so attractants, or signals they are repellent to the animal, so they sense as a threat somehow that's toxic. So one of those assays is what we call an avoidance test. We use a repellent and we put that in the worm and that repellent travels in the worm to the head where the ciliated neurons are and they induce a response. If the worm is correctly responding to the signal, it would detect that and tell its muscle system to track back and move away from the source of the signal. If, on the other hand, we have successfully hit a gene that has rose in cilia and therefore prevents cilia, cilia function in these neurons, then the worm doesn't perceive that signal, ignores it, and moves uh, forward correctly and doesn't really bother about it, which obviously is not a great thing because it's failing to perceive potentially an important presence of a toxin that it needs to avoid. So I'll show you an example of how this works in this case. So here's an wild type worm, and this is a, one of the mutants of a gene that, a gene that we isolated that shows a defect. As you notice then the researcher comes here and drops a little drop of this um, avoidance cue and then whereas the animal that's all type can respond, backtracks and moves direction, the other animal, the mutant here does not, it moves forward without actually changing its direction. So suggesting that it potentially has a mutation in that. From detecting an animal and finding a potential mutant that might have an interesting information as far as a new cilia gene, 
then we move into cloning and mapping that gene. And when we know that information, we can then devise different ways to try to track down the protein, and understand whether it's really present in the cilia. So in the end of those neurons, they are in the sensory organs of the animal. And one of the ways to do that is to actually use transgenesis to produce GFP animals, so encoding the information for that specific gene that we discover through the mapping that shows that phenotype, that defect phenotype, and then expressing that in a live animal. And you can see here in a fluorescent image and then in your DIC overlap that it's the signal here is present right correctly in the region where those ciliated neurons are right at the end of the opening of the sensory organs illustrated here. So that confirms that we have hit something that potentially not only affects behavior in the way that we expected, but also localizes as far as protein to the right region. So the third, um, the third uh, I guess, step that we diverse in terms of the type of projects that we do really opens up the a plethora of alternatives for research that depends in large part in what kind of gene we have hit. So say that you found out that this is a tubulin related gene or binding or, or a regulatory gene, um, and eventually you might look into specific aspects of the formation of the, say, axoneme, right? And then devise your experiments in order to test hypotheses that are related to that. But this involves a series of steps that are illustrated here in terms of potential outcomes. So the characterization of the function of those, those, those new ciliary genes are shown here. So you have things, for instance, that is using a lot of high definition fluorescent microscopy. We have a suite in the department and also a Delta Vision microscope in the lab that we use for that. And that's one of our images for one of the genes that we clone and, and work with. Um, from the analysis at the level of microscopy, you can do functional assay. So that's amplifying the different levels of analyzing the phenotypes that I discussed with you in terms of how is it that cilia is really affected, how many behaviors are they affecting in terms of the, the new mutation by doing functional tests. And we have an interesting equipment in the lab called a worm tracker, which can optimize that. It's basically a system that can image your plate with your tiny worms then and test different behaviors, record in a video and then analyze it quantitatively. So you have an idea of how is it that specific mutation has affecting the behavior of the animal that can be quantified shown here. And then you can go down to try to understand more in a more systemic way exactly how is it that the mechanism behind that gene is being controlled by again using transgenesis or gene editing. We do CRISPR-Cas9 in the lab to generate different strains of C. elegans which might have different defects in that gene. So targeting specific sites of that gene for mutagenesis or potentially other related genes which we think are associated with the function of this new mutation. And from there, we go to a more of a um, amplifying to validating that information outside of the C. elegans context. So do some translational research with some of our collaborators in the medical school to find out first other proteins that are associated, oops, excuse me, they associate with this uh, original protein that we isolated, but also the potential homologue of this gene in humans and whether human cilia is also dependent on the function of a homologous protein. And that's important because it potentially can lead us to understand other sources of ciliopathies that haven't yet been characterized as far as disease in humans, right? All right, so I'll finish here just to say, it's just to illustrate the, the pipeline of experiments that we can do in the lab. Obviously there's other things that, you, that we do depending a lot on the genes that we are working. But right now, and the reason not to bring up this specific projects to, um, to open up a project that we are recruiting now to understand better the function of a non-conserved family member of Shigoshin uh, in cilia. So this is a known protein family that have rows in chromosome segregation. It is important to prevent the early dissociation of sister chromatids. And because of that, it was uh, uh, mapped and baptized by Japanese researchers as Shigoshin, which is the Japanese deity uh, that protects the, the uh, temple, so the garden of the gate. And we have found out that in C. elegans, Shigoshin has a different function, and that is in terms of the uh, structuring cilia and working with uh, sensory perception. So we're now recruiting somebody to take over this project and characterize better how is it that gene family is affecting cilia. All right, so I think I've said it enough. I'll leave you with this uh, quote from Nietzsche, uh, which is obviously not the intended sort of um, the intended meaning, but um, kind of works well for biology as well, just to suggest it to you that even though we might think we don't really learn much from a worm, it turns out lots in us can go back to what is happening in very low eukaryotes like worms. If you have any other questions that you'd like to ask me or uh, about my project, my lab or the university, you can email me, and that's the information down there. 
And I'll leave you here and then give this back to Bibiana if I know how to do this. Let's see. No worries, it's not there. You yeah. Can you can you done. take it over by yourself or do you need uh, to do anything? Yes, I think Juan Jose, can you can you help me just so I can share my screen? Thank you very much. Um, while that's happening, uh, I would like to thank yeah, Adele and Carlos. And as you can see, it, this was just uh, meant to, to provide a big overview of what Carlos is doing in his laboratory at the University of Saskatchewan and what Adele is doing in his laboratory at Laval Université. Uh, before going into questions, I'd just like to quickly um, provide information on how you can contact either of these professors. You will see now on my screen, this is the form that I talked to you at the beginning. So if you go to our website, uh, caldo.ca, you will see this, this form there. You can just uh, fill out with your information and you can, if you're a professor, you can just say, you know, I'm a professor. I would like to connect with either Carlos or Adele and we can help you um, do those connections. If you're a student interested on potentially working with either Carlos or Adele, uh, please note that, that in the form that you're a student interested in um, connecting with them. In terms of students, I guess I saw a question um, in the Q&A, um, and you may start posing your questions. Um, I saw a question in terms of funding. So I mentioned at the beginning that the role of Caldo is to help you, uh, to help the students, prospective students, graduate students to come to Canada by providing assistance in terms of how they apply to the different um, universities that are part of the consortium. But we, our work goes beyond that. So we all, what we also do is we work with these countries that you see in your screen right now in Latin America. So it's Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, and Uruguay. And we have agreements, so we create agreements, we work with the governments with, um, of, of these countries to facilitate the mobilization of graduate um, students to, to Canada. Um, and these are some of the agreements that we have in case that you're from those countries, I'm pretty sure you have heard of this, of these entities. If where you're interested is in short-term um, uh, internships, uh, let us know and we will let you know about um, the possibilities for that. So in terms of um, questions, let me just go back. Sorry, I'm just going to go back here to my screen. Give me just one second. Yeah, so I'm going to continue with the Q&A right now. And I just saw a question for Edel. Edel, um, uh, Raisa, Raisa Silva would like to know if you use uh, pro protoemic tools as well in your laboratory. <clears throat> yes, uh, so a big part of the effective tree immunity will be through proteomics tools. So I don't know if uh, she knows about the Turbo ID, Bio ID. So it's something that we want to use eventually in the lab. And to be able to use that tool, we need to use also a protein mass spectrometry. So it's something that for sure we are going to do. Great. Maybe in two years, one year, but yes. Great, thank you, Adel. Um, Carlos, I have a question for you. And uh, what I would like to know is, based on your experience supervising uh, graduate students, are there any qualities or um, that you think graduate students should have or should work on in order to successfully complete uh, graduate studies? I remember at the beginning you mentioned um, something about uh, being patient. I'm sorry, that was Adele. But is there, are there any qualities you think graduate students should, should uh, work on in order to successfully complete graduate, uh, graduate program? Yeah, for me or for Adele? For, for you, Carlos. Oh, well, I echo what, you, what Adele would have said there. Patience is definitely <laughs> one. Um, I think students that are potentially thinking about graduate school should really consider what graduate school is. There is quite a few students that might have a different perception of what is grad, graduate school, and, and these are the ones that usually struggle during the program. Um, in, in very simple terms, and I could discuss it more if students are interested, but I think that the really critical thing is to have a genuine interest in become a researcher or, or put yourself into research. Graduate student is not a sort of alternative to a career, right? It's not something you do expecting something else to come along. If that's the, the, the sort of outset um, view, you, you, you should know right now that it won't went well because <laughs> it's, it's generally when, when people falter is when they really feel the frustration of graduate school, which happens often if you're not really interested and if you're not, your heart isn't into it, you know, it's an easy thing to sort of let overcome you. So have being eagerness to, to research, have that in, in actually the center reason for coming to grad school, having a, a drive to do research, 
um, and the interest to become an independent researcher, so to learn, right? It's uh, different than an undergraduate degree. Graduate studies are not meant for you to be receiving information and sort of being tested on that information. That's not how research works, really. Uh, research in graduate school in science, anyways, is an opportunity for you to explore the boundaries of your knowledge and to search for new knowledge yourself. So that in the, in the end of your program, you are the expert, not your supervisor and not anybody around you. So if you have a passive perception of graduate school that you're going to be sitting there and learning from your supervisor or for somebody else, then it's also not a great thing. You need to come with the idea of go and make things happen for you and learn from people around you and taking the opportunities that are presented to you. That'll be my, yes. my main things. Thank you so much, Carlos. Uh, Adele, Marcia Diaz would like to know if you can speak a little bit about the microscope, the sorry, microscope, microscope, microscopy, sorry, that is used in your research. A microscopy. That is microscopy. Using? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Well, uh, we probably would not do so many things fancy like uh, Carlos, uh, but we for sure will study, for example, the localization of the vectors, uh, interaction of the vectors uh, with the gene target. Those are things that we can do through microscopy. And uh, what else? Well, we can study if we go that way also the cell cycle. There is a big expert in Saskatchewan that uh, Jan Way, uh, he was one of my supervisors. and. He has developed a really beautiful work to study the, the cell cycle, but it's not the focus of my lab. But we can always use those tools to, to mainly to study effectors. That's the main thing I want to, to focus is, for example, see uh, these three effectors I mentioned in the presentation, they should be a apoplastic, and we have already evidence for one of them. So, is something like that, a uh, confirm localization, interactions, uh, or for example, uh, one of the factors that we start in Saskatchewan, we're supposed to induce a change in the cell cycle. We can confirm that through microscopy. Uh, like Carlos mentioned, he studied the, the cell cycle. So something that we can do through microscopy. Thank you, Dan. And as, as you notice, uh, as you're becoming, uh, or, or you're gaining more expertise, uh, the world becomes smaller. And uh, as you know, I don't know if you, if you, if you heard, but uh, Edel did uh, postdoc uh, Carlos Carvalho's uh, laboratory in the University of Saskatchewan. So you can see definitely the interconnection interrelation there as uh, you know, the world's becoming more and more, and more smaller. Um, now that I have you here, Edel, I would like to uh, ask you another question. And that is, um, I noticed, and I think that's true for most scientists nowadays, that your journey has been very international from Cuba to Mexico to the States, now in Canada. Are there any skills or there, is there any advice that you can be, can you provide to prospective um, graduate students in terms of abilities on how to adapt uh, to successfully, again, complete a degree when, you know, they're moving from country to country and, and, and experiencing different cultures. Is there, uh, is there any advice that you could, could, that you could provide to them? Well, Carlos Tripp, I, I didn't know that was also really international. He went from Japan to U.S. to, to Canada, Brazil. So yes. We, yes. I, I think that is a common thing mm -hmm. uh, between, uh, and it's something that for us Lat Latin Americans, is a, is a strength when we do that because um, that shows that we are able to integrate in different environments. Uh, my advice is always be open to new cultures. Uh, learn, don't forget your roots, but also don't impose your roots. Like it's something that, that many Latins and <laughs> Cubans are a big example of that. When we go to different countries, the many Cubans want to make the people adapt to them. Uh, we have to learn that we are coming to their place, so we don't have to forget our roots or we don't have to change things, but it's important uh, to, to, to be able to adapt, enjoy the experience, learn everything you can, not only in the lab, also outside of the lab, learn 
the habits, um, what people in, in that country likes. So in that way, you can uh, enjoy better the experience. Thank you so much, Adele. And that is true. I think now for researchers and this, and I think that I think prospective students should know that the life of a researcher is very international, right? So they need to build those skills to be able to adapt and live in different countries and be open-minded, right, to, to, to the, the new experiences. Um, I saw there was a question there for Carlos, but I believe you already answered it. Thank you so much, Carlos. And um, I see another two, two questions here about um, if we're going to have more webinars, so basically suggestion that we have a webinar in chemistry and pharmacy. We would love your, your ideas. So if at the end, you can just, there is a very brief survey. I think there are three questions. And one of the questions is, are there any other topics that um, you would like to, to see future in this webinar series? So please um, make the, if you can note those there, that'll be great. Um, and in terms of if there's any advice in terms of when you want to apply, if you, they should apply apply first to, to a program or they should connect with with a tutor um, so what what I would suggest definitely is um, if you can go to our website we have a webinar specifically on how to connect with uh, prospective supervisors um, the etiquette right on, on when the first contact like what documents to send what do you email what information um, how often do you need to check uh, with with professors um, so definitely I will suggest for you to 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 watch the webinar um, but I guess to answer the question it really varies from what I heard from, from program to program. It's great if you already have a connection with a professor uh, that could potentially be your supervisor, but um, yeah, definitely it, it, it could vary from, 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 professor, from program to program. Um, just looking at the time here, um, I will also just, I will just have a, a, a last question. Uh, for Carlos, and that question is, Carlos, is there anything in terms of uh, academically uh, readiness that you will suggest uh, prospective students that they could work on right now before applying to any graduate program? Any skills, again, maybe um, some research that they could do prior to, is it in, yeah, in terms of academically uh, readiness, is there any advice that you could um, provide to prospective students? Yeah, there's, there's a limited number of things you can do if you're obviously looking to join a research program, but I'll give you an advice, and I think Adele will feel this soon enough when he starts receiving applications as a professor. You know, if you want to stand out and be noticed by a professor that is potentially going to be a supervisor, remember, we, everybody receives our professors, lots of emails all day, and we are pretty good at noticing when you're sending emails to 20 or 50 other people and, and not really individualizing your email. So, First off, before anything else, think about what interests you. What do what you think excited about? This is not something you would do in one or two months. You're committing here sometimes five, six, seven years of your life. So think of what you like. And when you do, search for people that do things that are like the things you like. And when you find these people in their different departments, read a little bit of what they do. These are researchers. They publish things. They are available to the lay public. Find their papers. Read them. You're not gonna understand everything. It might be hard at times, but have an idea of what they do. Once you do, and you can match what you like with an existing research from a professor, then write and write to that person. Write saying, listen, I read that paper of yours. I didn't understand everything, but that seems really cool. When you do this, immediately you caught the attention of a supervisor. And you do because we, we learn actually to pick up on people's interest and, and, and sort of scam out through all the emails. They are not really, really things that we notice that persons are interested in what we do. So if you want to spend time preparing yourself and really all you can do is really search around to see what's out there, that would be my advice. Read, read scientific information because that's one thing that will help you if you're going to go into grad school forever. You have to be able to read. And if you read and you learn about somebody's research, then you can write to these people and say, listen, this is what interests me. And I wonder if you, if you think I'll be a good fit for your department of your lab. That would be my suggestion. Thank you so much, Carlos. That's a very, very sound advice uh, for all our prospective students uh, listening to the webinar. And also, just before closing, I would like to make you aware that Caldo Consortium is going to be having a virtual fair. And at this fair, representatives from gr the graduate departments uh, from our member universities will be there. That way you can talk to them about, you know, a specific uh, requirements uh, in order to apply to the different programs that you could be interested. Um, that fair is going to be in October. And I will suggest for you to stay tuned and uh, 
um, through our social media and our website so you can find out more details about the fair. Um, thank you very much, Adele. Thank you very much, very much, Carlos. Is there anything else you would like to add before closing the session? Oh, no, no. I'd like to thank everybody. Thank you and nice to see you with them. <laughs> yes, nice to see you, Carlo, and uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, just uh, everything that Carlos said is really important. Don't send uh, generic emails and don't send email, a message through Facebook or no. Instagram saying, I want don't to join your lab. Yeah. <laughs> do not copy and paste messages for 510. Or <laughs> don't do that. No, that's important. That's actually very, very important. And thank you so much for mentioning that because, yeah, I have to say I've seen that, that happening. So especially, you know, the connecting through social media. Um, yeah, I happen to be married to a scientist. And, and yeah, this is the same thing that he also says, like, connect through proper channels, right? Um, yes. So thank you so much, everyone, for listening to, to our webinar uh, today. And I hope to see you in our next webinar. Um, and have a great afternoon, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.